intergalactic, international, intercontinental, hemispheric, North American, United States, Washington, mm -hmm. District of Columbia, Lao New, New Year Festival, Festival, here at the TCG Theater Nation. Mm. Oh, Ajahn. Yes, I Lao New Year is my favorite time of year because it is the one time of year that all Laotians come together. Yes, yes, it is so true. It is important to celebrate where we come from. Mm -hmm. Laos may be a far off land in Southeast Asia, but we Laotians can be found everywhere. Mm -hmm. Where are the Lao? Mm -hmm. Put Lao you say. Oh, who here is from DC? Hmm? Anyone from DC? Oh, hello. You know how people in DC? Mm -hmm. Okay, you oh, meet right now. Okay. Virginia, uh -huh. yes, Maryland. There are Lao people in There are Lao people in New York, mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Connecticut, mm -hmm. Minnesota, mm -hmm. Oklahoma, mm -hmm. Texas, West Coast, Texas, mm -hmm. um, West Coast yes. or Oregon, yes. California. Mm -hmm. Lao people in Alaska. Oh, yes. Oh, and Hawaii too. Oh, yes, 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 Hawaii. Oh, yes. there are also now people internationally. Oh, yes. uh, England, oh, yes. Canada. Oh, yes, number one female tennis player. Mm -hmm. Falang, yeah. France, uh -huh. Argentina. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh Tabai D, Australia. Ajahn mm Somsi, -hmm. <coughs> you should not bow so quickly. Oh, A yes, true yes. Lao properly greets someone and bow slowly. Yes. Now. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know the young people, mm -hmm. they often oh, ask no. me, why is it grandma, grandpa? Mm -hmm. They see it so slowly. Wow, sa, sa. They take their time. Mm. Mm -hmm. sa -sa -di. Are they tired? Are they lazy? Are they drunk? No, it is because they are very sabai. Man, now. Very relaxed. If I were to say to you, relax! <laughs> I am not so relaxed. You are not so sabai. I am not so sabai. Okay, let's help Ajahn be sabai. Let's please all put our hands together. Help me, no. please put your hand together. Mm -hmm. No, we call this your heart, remember. Man, now, bye. Okay. Jai, jai, sabai B on three, okay? Mm -hmm. One, two, song, three. Song, Sabai B. Oh, I feel better already. I hope you feel Oh, very nice. So, Ajahn, Why since are we, we are here? breaking things down. Let us tell them what Ajahn means, Ajahn. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Ajahn is a Lao word. And Ajahn, some see here is an Ajahn because she is a University of Hawaii East West Center scholar and a PhD professor of uh, 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 what I literature. I, literature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she teaches at the University of uh, ne Nebraska. Oh, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And she is a former Miss Lao New Year. Oh, yeah, Ajahn, that was a long time ago. I have since got my PhD and tenure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Ajahn Somsak here is an Ajahn because he is. Oh, okay. My mm -hmm. His uh, royal family lineage goes back to Luang Prabang, man, no, man, the no. uh, former capital city of Laos, mm -hmm. uh, where he uh, studied at the Wat uh, Wat Wat. Wat Siang Tong. Yes, Wat Siang Tong, the temple, uh, where he studied uh, knowledge and in always seeking knowledge and wisdom for enlightened men. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. Thank you for that great introduction, oh, yes, I just uh -huh. don't see. Yes, mm -hmm. So today we are here to celebrate the rich cultural heritage of Lao. Yes, right. mm -hmm. Today's program includes Lao cultural entertainment, yes. Lao traditional fine food, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. art exhibition. Art exhibition. Ah, mm -hmm. But don't forget the Tamakung, the oh, Papaya Salad yes. Tasting Contest. That is a big <laughs> event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also have the Miss Nang Sakan Parade and the Miss Lao New Year Beauty Pageant. Mm -hmm. ah, but, but, but Ajahn. Yes, Ajahn. There, there are some uh, phalang here in the audience. Oh, white people. Yes. Okay, I see a few. Mm -hmm. <coughs> why? But they, the, why don't they know about Laos? Why, why don't people know about Laos? They know about Thailand. They know about Vietnam. Uh, they know about Cambodia. They know uh, about Burma. Uh, Myanmar, Ajahn. Uh, Burma. No, Myanmar. Ajahn. It's Burma. Ajahn. 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 It's Burma. Ajahn. 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 Ajah
Mm-hmm. Well, I think people know more about the Hmong because of their connection to the CIA. Oh, I don't know. That's right. That no, 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 Central no, no, Intelligence. There were I used to see them work loud. That is to be. We are here in the sea. I can't be political. But we have a Jamboom song from Fresno. Oh, yes, yes, yes. A Jamboom song. Yeah, he is a master can player. Okay. A wonderful treasure in our community. I love the can. Yeah. Because Lao music is the best. Ah, Lao dance is the best. Lao culture is the best. Yes. Lao is the best. Lao is the best. Lao is the best. Okay. Kop chai. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's just a quick excerpt of our show, Refugee Nation, and we we frame it in a Lao New Year festival. So in between the scenes, though. We have, in between the festival scenes, we have uh, scenes that take place out in the community and around the country. And the way that we created this show was to collect uh, stories from the Laotian refugee community across the country and put them together in the show. Um, and what we found a lot was, certainly the Lao New Year Festival is the big festival where everybody gets together. Um, and it's always a good face. It's always the cultural dance and the folk traditions. Um, but everyone on stage has had a refugee experience. And we were talking about um, most of the interviews that we found out at every city we went to. It was the big thing was intergenerational uh, disconnect. Um, so we have a scene uh, where there is an elder and a college student talking, and the, the recent college graduate actually is trying to do an oral history project um, and wanting to interview her elders, um, but then coming across an elder who is a leader in the community, but. Um, unknown to her, but probably could have been predicted. He was uh, PTSD, suffering from PTSD himself. Um, so talking, it was very difficult to get him to talk about his past. Um, but also through this work, we've learned that um, talking about your past is also part of the healing process. So we've had those experiences in presenting this work in the community um, for, for healing from the refugee experience as well. Um, so uh, the, the play took us um, about 10 years to develop. <laughs> um, having met different communities, and so uh, this is an image of, uh, if you can see the image, it's our presentation, I believe this one is uh, at our most uh, current version, which w uh, was presented at the Los Angeles Theater Center uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and then uh, yeah, this was uh, the scene where Leila is talking about where I play an elder and she plays a, a younger yeah. generation in, in, in these issues. So as Leilani had mentioned, as much as artists that we want to present in a theater space it, with lights and sounds and set, uh, guess what? The community doesn't come to the theater or they're not used to coming to the theater. So what do we do? We go out into the community and we present. And this is a, actually a presentation uh, of an excerpt of similar to what we just did uh, at a Lao New Year festival in Sacramento. And uh, guess how many people were out there? Let me show you uh, the crowd that was looking at us. That's our audience. But how do we get that audience into the seats? And so we have to be a vi uh, able to find some way um, within our artistic practice in, in the way that we created it. Unfortunately, in the way that we created uh, Refugee Nation, it's very, um, the word is modular. So they're, they're scenes, they're episodic. And so we, could, uh, we were able to do that. And Sacramento was amazing. Out of, I'll uh, uh, show with you a quick story. When we did the show in Berkeley, we uh, performed it at La Peña Cultural Center. There's a huge community of Lao people in Richmond, which isn't too far from Berkeley. And uh, we performed at Alao New Year of over 600 people there. We did this particular excerpt right here. Love it! Woo! I love it! It's great! So we said, okay, great, come and see the show. It'll be at Berkeley, it'll be over at La Peña Cultural Center. Um, and they said, oh, no, no, no. And as we, as we were leaving, I think uh, some of the elders were like, oh, that, that, that was enough, that was great. And I was, I was like, no, but there's more. Please come, you know. Hey, you know what? You know, it, it's, it's over at La Peña Culture Center. It's on Shattuck Avenue. It's just one exit away from Costco. And I know you all go to Costco. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of those things where it's just, uh, you know, a challenge to get the audience to come out, and especially our communities. And so they end up, we, we got about 10% of the community that came out to that performance. 
And when they do come, I mean, and seeing the performance, seeing the reflection of their community out there, it's definitely very transformative, impactful, and powerful. So, um, so a lot of the work was created very uh, episodically. So some scenes we could do at Lao New Year festivals and other scenes uh, we couldn't really do at outdoor festivals because it was too uh, dramatic and really needed a quiet space. Um, and so, uh, so we, but we still have done it. Um, like this was a rehearsal that we did at the Kamai Arts Academy in Long Beach um, before we were about to head out on tour again. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what I wanted to say and what this reminds me of this image is how even though the play that we've created, Refugee Nation, is it's a very Lao centric play. It's about the Lao community. It's based off of the Lao community, but out of that story are human and universal themes that connect. Uh, this is at uh, a primarily Cambodian uh, community in Long Beach. This is the Kamai Art Center in a community center in their space and similarly this, where they, uh, uh, Thum, who is the artistic director there, um, invited us to come and, and share our piece. And there are all these connections. I mean, the, the Cambodian community, the Vietnamese community, the Hmong community. Um, and so, <coughs> Similar, uh, similar stories, but uh, told in, in um, specific points of view. Mm -hmm. So one of um, the, the commissioners of our work was actually from Alaska. And so we, one of our first places we went to was Anchorage, Alaska, and we presented an early version of the work. And Anchorage, people don't know, is per capita one of the most diverse cities in the country. So we performed at a middle school and did a workshop at the middle school. And it's probably the first time we were able to do a theater workshop with 20 Hmong students, just all Hmong students. Um, and we presented it in an assembly to a very diverse, they speak something like 17 languages at this middle school, including Native Alaskan languages. Um, and so th there was many people who could relate to the show. Um, it was interesting because one of our, our community organizer actually was Hmong. And she was telling her son, who went to that school, to go to this workshop. And he was like, no, I want to go to that workshop. I'm not a refugee. And so she sat him down and said, well, let me tell you what your grandmother went through to bring you to this country. <laughs> and by the, end of the, she, by the time she told uh, the story of escaping from Laos uh, during the Vietnam War era and coming to the United States, he was proud to be a refugee and then came to the workshop and participated in the workshop. Um, so that has happened with this work. Over, we've been now touring it for uh, a decade. And so in every city we go to that has happened, this intergenerational conversation has started from the show. Um, but very early on, we also were sent to Homer, Alaska, where there were no refugees. <laughs> and so we were, well, how do we work with elementary, we've given an elementary school workshop. So how do we work with elementary school students to, um, tell, to have them understand the story of a refugee? So we engaged various versions uh, of Augusta Boal technique and various other techniques um, to help um, figure out how do we em create empathy around the refugee experience. So, um, for example, we did anybody want to? Hey, hey, Bernie, thanks for us pulling you in. Would you like to be a help help with this workshop with us? Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna just demo it instead of uh, making you all put down your lunch. And can we have one more volunteer? Anyone? Just. We're gonna do a little, come on. Yeah, come on. Come on. <laughs> okay, so are you guys familiar with the Augusta Boal? The who? Augusta the who? Boal. The who? <laughs> model the image, ever heard of model the image? Just teach them, just okay. teach them later. Okay, we're gonna do a speedy version, speedy version of model the image. Um, so, model the image is, do you know model the image? You heard? Small kind. Okay, so you are the sculptor, you are the oh. clay, okay? So he will create an image for us. Um, why, by positioning you without speaking in, the re in a position that reflects the image we're talking about. Okay, so model the image of, uh, I'm gonna be speedy, model the image of war. So usually in this process, yeah, we would tell them you can show them how to do it, like just with your facial expression so that they can mirror it. You can also move them specifically. Uh -huh. So go ahead and stay in that Just image that uh, real well. I'm gonna adjust a little okay. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you so, go. yeah, there, there we go, that's great, okay. 
Okay, and release. Great. So, um, thank you guys. Thank you. you know, that was a speedy uh, model of the image. I mean, usually it's scaffolded. You know, one line does the sculpting, one line does the modeling. We do a couple words. Um, and then we do like tableaus uh, where we put those images together to create uh, one image. Um, so, with the Homer, it was our first experiment with working with a non refugee workshop around a refugee issue. And we asked him to do images of war. Um, so, uh, kids play war all the time. Everyone did uh, an image of a soldier or death, uh, someone dying. Um, and at the end of the workshop, we, we asked, well, how come no one did refugees? You know, so predictably, if we're in a room, most of the time when we do model the image of war, people will do soldiers, they will do dying, they will do bombs exploding. Um, but they don't do refugees, unless, of course, we have refugee students in the class. And those are the only times we see people do images of refugees. And the thing that we want people to walk away with is, every war that has ever been, there are refugees. And so when we engage in war, whether you're for it or against it, um, not preparing for what happens to the refugees is something that all of our countries are not prepared for. Um, so we have taken this work and started working um, with the last three years, we culminated working with taxi drivers. Um, for us, it was a very natural progression because in taxis, we found people who themselves were refugees, had been um, uh, freedom fighters in another country before they came here, had been lawyers, had been doctors, um, were family men, and they found that ride, driving a taxi was a good entryway pr uh, profession. And so we started collecting those stories three or four years ago, before the whole Uber Lyft <coughs> thing started. And um, we started collecting those stories. So uh, we went between Minneapolis and Los Angeles, collecting stories and doing workshops. And what's interesting in every city, depending on which refugee community or immigrant community is there, um, we definitely talk to different um, ethnicities. So in Minneapolis, um, this is our LA cast. Uh, and this, oh, there you go, go ahead. This is our, one of our first interviews in Minneapolis. Uh, we found that the taxi drivers, we were told by everyone that all of the taxi drivers came out at the Starbucks, which is right next door. <laughs> that Starbucks was so crowded, we had to go to the Ruger's Bagel next door to be able to have conversations. And right here we have two of our Minneapolis ensemble members, uh, the young women, Ifra Mansour and uh, Muk Semuta Monse. Uh, and we're interviewing these two men. Um, on the left of Ifra is Ifra's dad, who um, is a leader in the Somali community in uh, Minneapolis. Um, and in the middle, we have another man who is a taxi driver himself. So by Ifra's dad showing up, suddenly people were willing to talk to us because they knew who Ifra was. Um, oh, and the funny thing is Ifra is an actor and he's a musician. So the night of our performance, he couldn't come because he had his own show. <laughs> They're like, why are you coming to our show? But um, it was really incredible to have someone in the cast who was Somali, who was connected to the community, um, and helped us you know, invite people to talk to us. And um, so we got to know a lot more about the Somali community in Minneapolis through, taxi, through, through doing taxi driver stories and collecting taxi stories. Uh, we also went to the dispatch, and then we would ask our ensemble members to go out and collect the stories as well, so that when we came into workshop, they already had the stories in their minds. And then we use various exercises and games to try to work with the stories and find interesting ways to play with the stories to create uh, new stories uh, and create the show that we did. And so we ultimately had an ensemble in two cities um, so that we were able to present Global Taxi Driver in Minneapolis with a mix of LA and Minneapolis actors and then uh, in Los Angeles, primarily LA actors, but a lot of Minneapolis stories. Um, so next, uh, we just, have a list. just to add to what you're mm -hmm. saying, so uh, in addition to learning about the uh, refugee community uh, in Minneapolis and uh, Somalia, because we were working with taxi drivers in LA, as we did interviews and, and checked out taxi uh, companies, there were a lot of Eastern European, Ukrainian, Armenian. So it was really interesting to find these uh, lines, uh, these, these common ground, um, you know, in terms of refugee stories. 
uh, and uh, very impactful when we did it in Minneapolis at Intermediate Arts, uh, a high school we, we worked with, uh, Como High School, uh, Como Park High School brought their youth. Many of them are from Somalia, from that region. It was the first time they've ever heard their own language on stage. Mm -hmm. And it was just so very impactful and powerful for them to see that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just through Global Taxi Driver. So and, and again, uh, we were working with, to give Intermediate Arts their props, we were working with them. Um, and they set up the workshops in the schools. And um, that particular high school, again, was one of the most, most diverse high schools uh, in Minnesota. And they speak numerous languages. We ended up doing a workshop with like 40, at least 40 yep. or more students. Um, and various, um, you know, some of those girls were in, uh, in the headdress. Um, so, you know, there were things that we needed to adjust to make sure that, you know, we didn't partner boys with girls or the girls were partnered together so they could freely work with each other, especially around the model, touching each other. Um, but of course, our well-prepared uh, workshop is interrupted by a fire bell. So, <laughs> so we were sent out of the cafeteria where we were doing the workshop into the snowy parking lot um, to kill time. And so finally I said, like, well, which workshop, which exercises can we do? So we did, um, I, we sit in a circle, I, I was like, okay, well, we're standing here long enough, let's try to do some, some exercises. So we stood in a circle and we did the very basic um, uh, warm up where you do your hand one, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, down to one. Um, so we did that. And I'm like, okay, we're still standing here uh, from 10 to one. And I said, well, you know, there's so many languages in this circle. Let's do it in every language that we can think of. And so we did it in Hmong, we did it in Nepalese. Uh, we did it in Kiran, uh, we did it in um, Somali, mm -hmm. Sudanese, um, Swahili. I mean, we just kind of kept going and killed the time. But it was really beautiful to see the kids, well, first of all, for me to learn all those languages, um, and also for the kids to, for the first time, share the language with each other. Because one of the things, when there's that many languages in the room, you definitely could hear a hum going on. And, and you, you know, at first, as a teacher, you're like, ah, what's going on? No one's paying attention. But really what's happening is there's translation going on and the students are translating for each other. Mm -hmm. um, so this was a way to get it into the exercises and, and play with them and make it part of breaking down the barriers um, of being shy and not willing to kind of speak in front of a big group. Um, so, so continuing on our journey working with refugee and immigrant communities, mm -hmm. we're excited to say uh, our most current work that we're developing is with the Micronesian community in Hawaii. Um, and that's really exciting. Uh, the Micronesian community is uh, complex as we're learning. Um, and uh, there's been an influx in Hawaii and there's uh, been a big <coughs> rift because a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the generations before are looking at this new group and basically um, uh, just being ignorant about why they're there. Um, the Micronesians are, are uh, well, let me show you some pictures of, of some of the work that we've done. So, um, so Micronesia is a set of, uh, it's, there's Polynesia, there's Melanesia, there's Micronesia. So it's a, a hundreds of islands and many different countries um, under the banner of Micronesia. So what we're learning, we've only done, we did a, a series of workshops with youth in mm -hmm. Hawaii. Um, is the more we learn, the more we learn we don't know <laughs> what Micronesia is. Um, there's the Federated Nations of Micronesia. Federated States of, Federated Micronesia, States of Micronesia, which includes four different island groups, Yap, Chok, uh, Kosre, and Pompeian. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the Marshallese Islands, which isn't technically under that banner, but when we talk about Micronesians, they get clumped within that uh, heading label. label. Um, so in Hawaii, they're experiencing uh, a lot of prejudice and discrimination because um, their numbers are rising in the housing projects and in the healthcare systems. Um, and of course, the response of people who live, even in Hawaii, forgetting that their own background, uh, how could they come from similar backgrounds, um, is go back to where you came from. In this case, there's no place to go back to. The islands, uh, by 2020, some they're saying that something like 80% may not be livable because the water is rising. Um, not that they're going to be underwater, but that the water is rising enough to affect the drinking water, so they're uninhabitable. 
Um, so in this case, they really absolutely cannot go back. Um, uh, and and uh, whatever else we're gonna. <laughs> well, look at the picture. This is an yes. image of a workshop that we did with you. Yes. This is specifically with uh, uh, Chukiz Youth. Um, and uh, with an organization called Adults Friends for Youth. It's a social, uh, social service organization that counsels youth at risk. And these youth are specifically youth who, uh, in the high schools, when they get there, they send them to the police. The police can't deal with them, so they send them to uh, uh, Adult Friends for Youth. And they are there to counsel and to, to be there for them. Uh, in this particular image, we did uh, a workshop with uh, over 20 of them. And uh, we had asked uh, the story uh, of what, how do you see your community? I just asked words, uh, collective point. Uh, what is in your community? And one of the words that came out was cockroach. Mm -hmm. And so we laughed because we're like, oh, it's Hawaii, you know, the big flying cockroaches. Not realizing then it was like, oh, they didn't mean cockroach in that way. They meant that we, the Micronesians, were being called cockroaches. That's how they're being seen. That's how they're being perceived. And this was uh, from a workshop. Uh, they're, they're a tableau of a reflection of that for them. So like based on the model, the image, you know, uh, scaffolding those exercises into building tableaus, we asked them to, OK, so we asked, well, what does cockroach mean? And they, they all in unison said, it means us. This is what the community calls us. And in fact, there was a radio DJ who was using the word cockroaches just to describe the Micronesian <coughs> community. And luckily, people protested that, and, and he got into trouble. But it's just a reflection of what is in the language in Hawaii right now against the Micronesian community. Um, so we, we challenged them, with, separated them in groups, and said, OK, well, take on one of these words that was in the community poem. And this group took on cockroaches. Um, so as you can see, two, two youth are playing. Uh, cockroaches and the others are trying to stomp on the cockroaches. And so we saw this image and we take, had to take a moment back and say, okay, I didn't tell you we were doing theater of the oppressed, but this is a clear image of oppression to me. And so we had to have a discussion about what oppression is. And, and this high school group, they, the counselors told me, like, you might need to explain what oppression is to this group because they didn't even know what it was. So. Um, <coughs> Where I was like, this image, this is exactly, to me, an expression of oppression. Um, but of course, we had a long conversation around what is happening in Hawaii um, and what creates that feeling. Um, so as you can see, for, for if you think about it as a youth, uh, the challenges, if you are of, from that community, to, to even find a sense of uh, pride, a sense of confidence, um, hopefully through what we're working uh, we can highlight, uh, you know, that sense of pride, and we wanted to highlight. So this was just uh, uh, an extension of the workshop, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, connecting with the community, there is an organization called Pacific Voices, um, led by Innocenta uh, Kiku Sound, who is actually one of our allies. She is herself Chukis, uh, a leader in her community, and these are her kids. And so we uh, partnered up with them. Um, and this is, uh, they, they have a space at uh, the uh, public housing sector, um, uh, Kuhio Park Terrace, KPT, for those who are familiar with that. And they have a space, and she just brings the youth uh, to connect and to learn about their culture. And so we are, we're inspired to kind of partner up and hopefully bring, uh, you know, a sense of uh, theater and, 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 and our practice. <coughs> Into them, so. so and of course with this group, you know, we're like they're younger, they're ele elementary school kids. We we're like we'll teach them theater games and we'll do basic uh, theater games with them and maybe some theater of their press model the image. But we weren't trying to get them to do images of war or oppression or we didn't try to um, push them in that direction at all. Um, but they themselves ended up doing tableaus that showed very violent images. And I was like, well, there was guns, there was death, there was people um, hitting each other. And so I asked them, like, why, why are you doing, you know, is this live in your community? Is this your day-to-day -day life? Or is this from movies? And they're like, oh, no, this happens all the time. Um, so this is at Kuhio Park Terrace, which is a housing project. They said, oh, yeah, just the other day, the folks, the guys from CAM4 came down. And CAM4 is the other housing project. And there's a rivalry between the two housing projects, which are just up the freeway from each other. Uh, they say, like, oh, yeah, there was a big fight just the other day in the parking lot, which is right outside this room. 
So I was reminded, I was born and raised in Hawaii, and I remember that it was a violent uh, place to grow up, um, but I had forgotten. And by every single workshop we had done, from the elementary school kids all the way to the elders, violence came up, and I had forgotten just how violent it can be to grow up in Kalihi. Um, I didn't grow up in Kalihi, Ova did grow up in Kalihi, but I, I had forgotten I'm that. here. Here he is. <laughs> um, so uh, that, was, that was something that we're, we're in the process of developing this work. We've just started. We're going to head back to Hawaii in July to do more story collection. Um, then uh, at the same room as that, uh, with Eno's help, she also put together a, she has a women's group with the Chukis women. Um, so she invited me to come and be the guest speaker at the women's group. Um, and we, you know, she didn't tell them we were doing theater. I didn't want to, you know, let on we were doing theater. I didn't want people to get scared. Um, so we just did story circle style of theater. Uh, not telling them it was theater. And so we sat in a circle. Um, and we, I did like the name game. So it's um, say your name and do a big motion with it. So it would be like, Ova, which he always does. And <laughs> Ova, I can't do it as big as him. Um, but they did it in their seats. And then, you know, everyone does their name. Um, but then we have to do everybody's name in the circle, so you remember everybody's name. So by the end of it, all of the women were like laughing and yelling, and they never didn't necessarily leave their chairs, but they were sweating. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm like, okay, guys, now I know you can be loud, and <laughs> um, and I know you can be expressive, and I know you can tell your stories. And that was theater. You just did theater, and this is fun. So then we did. Um, and then I did try to get them out of the seat by doing cultural mapping. Who here has done cultural mapping? You know what I'm talking about. So um, I asked them to you know, stand in the room where you were born. And so you get up and you stand in the room where you're born. Um, stand in the room where you live now. Um, so I did it. And I wanted to see how is it a little bit different with Chucky's women. Um, and I said, well, OK, so pretend these are the Chucky's islands. Stand in the room where you were born. And immediately they're like, oh, we're all going to go to one island because there was only one island that has a hospital. Um, so all the women got up, ended up on the, okay, they decided where the islands would be. The main island's here, the far out island's over there, there's another far out island over there. Most of the women get on the main island and there's three women out on the outer islands. Mm -hmm. So we asked them, well, you know, and Eno was the most surprised, our community organizer was the most surprised. She was like, wait a minute, what? I thought everybody would be on the main island. Where were you all born? So one woman says, I was born in the house. The other woman says, I was born in the bush. And then the last woman says, I was born on the beach. <laughs> so I mean, that was the first time I've ever done cultural mapping with a specific Chukis group. And I was really trying to figure out, OK, what is the difference? Because we're talking about having assimilation challenges. Um, and so even just doing cultural mapping, you know, we had to do, where were you born? And then where were you from? Because in Chukis, uh, or in Chuk, you know, some folks lived on the outer islands, but they all had to come to the main island for school, for hospitals, um, to catch the main ferry, to go to outside of Chuk. Um, so, I mean, already we're just learning so much from working with this group. And this is one workshop that I've done with that particular group of women. Um, so my next question that was, uh, oh, Eno also pointed out to us, I was trying to get like, okay, what are some of the fundamental differences about living in islands and then coming to Hawaii? Hawaii's still an island. Um, but the difference is coming to the United States and an urban center and an urban culture. Um, so what is different? Like, how do you move? Like, I, I imagine you move between islands in a different way. Um, so they explained to me how they have ferry boats that go along to each island and then go to the main island. So they pick up people along the way and go to the main island. Um, and of course, that means they're gone for like the semester of school, and then they go back. Um, so they started to tell me about stories about like being on the boat and talking with their friends, thinking that their friends are all going to school, and then suddenly at a certain point, they all start jumping off the boat because they wanna, they're not actually going with her. They're swimming back to the island because they're going to stay home while she goes to, the, to um, school on the main island. And then, of course, they had stories about, oh, there's always tears. I'm like, why? Because they're leaving their mom behind? And they're like, oh, no, not that. I mean, maybe the first time. No, after that, it's their boyfriends and their girlfriends staying on the boat as long as possible. And then their lover jumps off the boat to go back to the island while their boat sails away. Um, 
But the other key thing that Eno said was, you know, uh, in the United States, we think about the I, uh, water as separating us. In Chuk, they think about the water as connecting us. So we are connected by the ocean. Um, so with that, I wanted to introduce a writing exercise to you. Do you all have a writing? Do, do we have time still for writing? Yes, yes, yeah. it's one o'clock, let's do it. Let's do it. I would love to introduce this idea to you. So while you get out your, your utensil, I'll tell you a little bit story around how I came to this writing exercise. Um, <laughs> um, our friend who's a poet and a um, cultural leader in Hawaii named Daya, uh, Darlene Rodriguez, she's Filipina from Hawaii, um, introduced this writing exercise to me and it's called, um, uh, it's called I Carry in My Vaca. Um, so vaca meaning canoe. Uh, so thinking about the um, first Hawaiians uh, who sailed from Tahiti to Hawaii. Um, when they left Tahiti, they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know they would end up. All they knew is that they weren't going to come back. They were just following the stars and the currents to find Hawaii. Um, so I carry my vaca to me. Um, it means you, you start off with the words just I carry in my vaca or I carry in my canoe and then you write down what you would carry with you. So it could be very literal, the things you would carry with you. It could be metaphorical. Um, just think about that. I carry in my vodka. And we'll give you five minutes to just go ahead and write.
Uh, you got about another minute to just close out. You'd like to start closing out on either that list or what you're writing. <coughs> Good? Yes? Great. Does anyone want to read what they wrote? Would any, anyone like to share? Share? In their vaca, mm -hmm. what do they carry on their journey? Would anyone? Yes, back there. Go for sure. it. Um, yeah. I carry in my vaca my memories, mm. my Benadryl and EpiPen, because I have <laughs> um, My family and friends, snacks for the journey, my imagination, my courage, my dreams for the future. Um, regardless of whether I was or not, I probably have my fears in there somewhere. Um, art supplies, a notebook and pen, comfortable shoes, and my phone and charger. <laughs> Soon, soon the vodka will have the <laughs> That's a modern vodka. <laughs> Fear of the Walking Dead. You know. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, paper, pencil, <clears throat> memories, tools, maybe a knife, music, a shawl, a camera, a good book, my Tai Chi fan, my reading glasses, family photos, a tote bag in which to collect things, lip balm, and tissues. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Go for it. I carry my vodka, my Jackie, my what? My courage and five gallons of mountain spring water. We share one cup. I carry 12 Q-tips to clean my ears when necessary. I carry my silence so I can listen to the water, Jackie's stories and nonsense names, the flap of the hummingbird. Oh. Beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Brad. Um, so I, I take things I'm coming from, memories of where I'm from, memories of the people I've known, I bring with me what I need to survive the journey, food, water, clothing, what I'll need for where I'm going to survive, seeds, chickens, tools, <laughs> and what I need for life ahead, which all turned out to be cultural, like books, music, musical instruments, and recipes. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, recipes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else right. want to share? And you don't have to if you don't want to, so we're just opening it up. Cool. You? Yeah. Sure, no, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Let's do one more, and then we'll we'll. Uh, okay, mine was, and I'm sorry, I had I came in late, so That's mine was a little more metaphorical. Th That's perfect. It's all, yeah. it's all. Yeah, this I is might, an exercise. I might get it. a little emotional, so there we go. Um, I carry in my vodka the smell of yasmin on uh, Puritans and preachers, <laughs> mm. <laughs> privilege and guilt. Mm. Uh, an alphabet seen here as backwards, with letters that connect and take shape depending where you put them. Uh, Mazahar and Kansas, Beirut and Bethesda, Mill Valley, New York, Washington, Prablos, Damascus, Halab, Palestine, villages in mountains <laughs> that look to the sea. The Mediterranean. Hollowed buildings filled with bullet holes and memories. Streets I've never seen but recognize. Balconies filled with jasmine and mint. My grandmother's voice. Piaf and laughter, the rhythm of Dead Becky. Words that mean things I don't fully understand, but I'm beginning to remember. Dumb and Habibti. Wow, thank you. thank you. What a great transition. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, so th these are just, we're just sharing some of the exercises, but at this point, in our um, session, um, we'd like to have a, a discussion, a question and answer session. Well, and I wanted to say, I mean, the purpose of the exercise is to be 
um, specifically like it is a powerful exercise in thinking about what you would it is the vaca itself is metaphorical mm -hmm. right in this case we're talking about Polynesians and we're talking about ancient Hawaiians or ancient Polynesians coming to Hawaii but I found it as a powerful exercise in talking about the refugee experience so it could be what would you carry in your suitcase I mean with the Lao community we ask what did you carry like in the early stages of the piece we um, <coughs> We didn't have a set, so we would ask the community to give us the give us pieces uh, that they would they would have carried with them across the Mekong when they had to escape. Um, so our we would cover the stage uh, with dip cow, which is the little maybe go to a Thai restaurant to get the sticky rice in a little uh, straw container. We got a lot of dip cow to hang from the from the stage um, mats. Um, you know, different mostly it was a lot of cooking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be the same, this, this fabric here, or the more traditional ones, or those pieces that you would carry. Um, so there were so many stories that we got around what was the thing that you carried. And some people, uh, I remember one of your aunties, Ova's aunties, saying um, she put seeds in her mouth mm -hmm. so that she could plant the herbs when she got to Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, or where, wherever she ended up, that she could plant those herbs mm -hmm. so that she could have the right ingredients for her cooking. Yeah. Um, but in whatever case it is, whether it's the vodka or a suitcase or just anything you can carry, it is a really powerful exercise. And of course, in this conference setting, you know, like, bam, do it. But in our workshop, it's a lot more, again, scaffolded, uh, brought, given enough space for it to breathe, um, for us to think and talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. So we'd like to open up uh, the, this into a discussion or a Q&A, please. Theater, theater methodology any, any, any and Any questions, any comments, <laughs> any thoughts? Anything we need to clarify? Yes. I was going to make one comment. We were talking about um, um, helping younger generations understand the experience of older generations. I saw it done once with sort of um, older elementary, maybe older elementary school kids, I think, who, not, who were not necessarily themselves from a refugee experience, but it was almost a combination of this exercise sort of explaining, saying like, what if they came and you know knocked on your door and said your family has to leave in a half hour and you can only take as much as you carry. And so asking kids, what would they take with them? And it was really kind of adorable. Some of them were very, like I would take my blue sweatshirt with the sweater <laughs> and like and my Walkman or, you know, or Xbox or whatever. And, um, and, but others were really like very much more thoughtful and it was a way to give kids that entry point into what the refugee experience might be like that wasn't too har harrowing mm -hmm. um, to ask them to think about. What is your definition of a refugee? Someone who's been forced out of their homeland. Well, there's the very we've we've had that discussion many times. Uh, there's the what is the legal definition? Um, is uh, they're escaping war, I think. I believe okay, someone else can give me the legal, legal disaster definition. Or natural huh? Or natural, or natural disasters. disasters. So it's, it's true for natural disaster as well. The legal definition, actually, I happen to know, is Thank not you. natural disaster. It's you fled persecution, That's you've crossed an international border, mm -hmm. and it's on account of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Okay. <laughs> the stuff. Anyway, it yeah. There are different definitions. Of yeah, and then, but that's the legal yeah. definition is one, and then I was about to say that the the other definition. So, like legally, the Micronesians wouldn't be refugees, but um, the the term the people are using the term climate refugees. Mm -hmm. um, I think John uh, John Kerry actually started using the word the term climate refugees, even though. Technically, they're not refugees. And academics have started using forced migration forced as to be much yes. more yeah. Um, yeah. inclusive. inclusive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and then it's funny because we have a we also do a bit as the Ajans about breaking down um, the stages of a refugee, so it becomes even more metaphorical. Like, well, there's re the refugee mentality, um, and we talk about refugee mentality being in survival mode. Um, and as if, it, as, as if you could move from refugee to immigrant. And so the immigrant is someone who's adjusted, they may not speak the language, but they have a job, they're able to function in the society. Um, and a citizen being someone who takes care of the community and is active in the community. 
So it's not where the, uh, not the literal term of citizenship um, that you can vote, but that you actually are going to take care of your uh, community. And and that when we, we the the Ajans pose as not everyone can achieve citizenship. Even people born in the United States can't be a citizen. You know, don't necessarily uh, behave as citizens if you're not taking care of your community or thinking outside yourself. Um, so we play we play with that idea of what is refugee, a immigrant, and a citizen. Yeah. Have you ever thought of exploring, um, like, people who escape, like, say, the South Side of Chicago? <laughs> Like mm -hmm. neighborhoods of, that that are under duress and have to figure out how to get out of it. Yeah, we uh, I, we've never specifically targeted that, but I mean, I think in uh, I mean, developing uh, refugee nation actually, um, there's this actually one story. One of the characters in it actually, in the interviews, um, he was actually uh, a refugee from Laos. He didn't know he was because his parents didn't tell him. He ended up being jumped into a gang. Um, he's Lao, but he got jumped into a Filipino gang. Lives in Koreatown, trying to escape kind of that lifestyle, but for some reason is trapped because of the lack of knowledge. And he's, I mean, he's my generation. He's actually uh, of around my age. Um, and uh, seeking and searching actually for connection. He was looking for other Lao folks. And when he heard about our project, he actually came out and we interviewed him. And he had a fascinating story. Um, because of getting in trouble, he was imprisoned. Uh, he spent, he uh, did his years in prison. But uh, right as he was about to get out, INS came and, and took him and he was detained. Uh -huh. And he was uh, held in a de uh, Arizona detention center. Federal. Uh, and yeah. and, uh, and it was because he wasn't a citizen. He didn't, he found out he was not a citizen uh, when he was detained there, and then he asked his mother, who actually had PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so she, because of the fact that they hadn't communicated, I guess, in uh, the years that they've been here, that post-war, um, uh, after the, the effects of post-war, I guess, um, they, they never really had that conversation. And well, his, his lawyer forced him to find out, because he had to prove his refugee status. And at this point, he's in a federal prison. He <coughs> had a gang life. He's not sure why he's in a, he didn't even know he wasn't a citizen. Um, so his lawyer said, you need to talk to your mom about your, how you got here. And that's when he had, and to prove your refugee status. And that's the first time he spoke to his mother about escaping from Laos, about the Vietnam War. Um, and of course, since she had PTSD, she didn't want to talk about it. Um, and that's why she had never talked about it before. Uh, she, she was someone who lived um, in Los Angeles but never turned on the lights at night. Um, then that was one of her symptoms because during wartime you don't want to be able to be seen so you don't want to get bombed. So um, uh, the sounds in LA are very, uh, triggered her so the lights would always be off in their house at night. Um, anyway, so he had to go back to her and talk about this with her. Um, but there was one clear case of like needing to understand your refugee status and not knowing that you weren't a citizen. He wasn't a citizen. He just didn't know. Um, and we're finding out about, uh, in doing the work with the Micronesian community, we're finding out that a lot of kids are going through that as well. Um, and it's also not as clear cut because Micronesians aren't coming from war. They're, um, and they're not, you know, they're, they're, there's, it's, there's citizenship. There's weird, I'm so not good with remembering the legal um, ramifications that are going on between the U.S. and Micronesia, but there's a lot of um, they can be cannot. There's some laws that are saying they can't become citizens, so there's a whole bunch of different um, things going on, yeah, with that community. Um, but the kids who are getting into trouble are then finding out, oh wait, we're not a citizen. We we were raised here. We're you know what we don't get it. So. Uh, have you done, and forgive me if I missed the early part of the presentation, um, exercises like this with first generation kids and their parents? Yes. To talk about, and then understanding like how refugee status can, the mentality can continue into the next generation even if you're born mm -hmm. in, you mm -hmm. know, the country that you're living in right now. Mm -hmm. And what, what happened, like so the answer is yes, but what, ha what happened? Like what have you done? Did you find anything interesting? 
um, well, like the, the <coughs> Micronesian groups that we were talking about, they're all, the women were definitely first generation. Uh, the kids were first generation. Um, yeah, even, even the uh, youth, the high school youth were all first generation. Um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of them? <laughs> like, yes. the, so the impact. Yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> uh, from actually having done Refugee Nation nationally, um, I mean, there are many, uh, um, it, it's been healing for that first generation. Because uh, when uh, parents and grandparents or parents and children come and see the show or experience this, either a workshop or a process, they, they, they do talk. I mean, it opens up doors. Um, in terms of stories, I mean, it's kind of like what we were excavating with the Vaca exercise. Um, uh, one example was actually in Minneapolis when we did Refugee Nation, we met uh, a Lao uh, man who was actually in the military. He saw a map of the bombs, the bombing uh, sites, and he actually revealed to us that um, he helped radio in. He's Lao. Mm -hmm. He fought with the U.S against the other regime and he called in he's bombing his own people in his own country he actually because of being a part of this experience uh, and seeing refugee nation it it opened up it was a healing thing for him because he felt really guilty mm -hmm. being being you know and bombing his own people it took him that long he was actually in prison uh in a re-education camp after the war and then he was let go and, and, and released afterwards so he had this whole journey but um, it opens, and so his, his kids actually are learning more um, because it's, it's basically, we've been a catalyst for dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an, another really great, wonderful story is when we did it in Alaska, there's a large veterans community there uh, from various different wars, and actually, when we did the show, one of the veterans came up to me mm -hmm. after the show, and he gave me a picture and I was like, what is this picture? And it was actually a picture of him um, doing covert work with the U.S. He's American. He's white as white can be. And, but, but, but because he was a veteran of the Vietnam War, he wanted to give me this to share. And he was like, I, we need to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the, the transformative, uh, uh, impactful um, stories that we, we can share. I mean, it's... And it's one, one uh, when we, f early couple years, we started doing this project, um, the, we started talking about the re-education camps, the, they call it seminar, but uh, it's actually communist uh, detention centers in Laos that happened after the Vietnam War. Um, and we were telling, uh, we were talking to, his mom had seen the show for the first time, Ova's mom had seen the show for the first time, and we went out to dinner and we're talking to her, and Ova was like, wait a minute mom, uh, dad, what happened between the end of the war and us coming to the U.S.? That was what, five years or yeah, something? Yeah, from 1975 to 79. We arrived there in 79, the war was over in 75. So there's a four year gap there. So I was like, mom, what happened? What, 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 were we, what happened when the war you know, ended? You know, and she goes, oh, you, don't, you didn't know? <laughs> Your dad was taken to a, a, a seminar camp. He was taken to a re-education re camp. This is, all the years that I've, 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 you know, lived, I mean, it was close to 30 years, I never heard of this story. So it took us doing the show. To have her <laughs> reveal the story of, you know, to yeah. me. And I think that's where I think uh, generationally it's been, it's a struggle for them. And, and I mean, seeing, seeing the show, I mean, the show is about this. The, 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 two, the, the two things is, I want to know my history, and this is mostly from the younger generation. I, I really want to know my history, and then the older generation saying, you know, I want to forget my past. And that's, that's that conflict that we kind of share. And I mean, and it's open, and, and hopefully it, through, through the show, it, you know, people, people are open to that. Yeah, so, so, yes. Like, that's what I want for my parents. Right now, so I'm trying yeah. to, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. I just want to be yes. back on that, that idea, because I, I have a show that's also I'm Lebanese, and so it's mm. about the, the talking yes. to my grandmother. I've done a lot of work with the UN around these stories. And that, what you were saying for me, experience that sometimes the people who don't want to carry that anymore actually find a relief in telling it to the people who want to carry it now. Yeah. Yeah. And then the act that I was reminded of, of just literally speaking it. You know, I'm a writer, I'm a performer, I do this. It, you know, but even so, 
you know, the act of telling it and what that raises is so powerful. And um, I'm just really, I'm, I'm sorry that I missed the beginning, and I'd love to hear more about how you've used that in different communities. Just this this small exercise and that intergenerational sort of healing. Yeah. I think, um, I also, and I, before I forget, I also want to make sure that you, I don't know where your funding sources are, all of that, but, you know, having done some stuff with the UN, I think there would be some really interesting overlaps in what you're doing because of their, like, they have, you know, a lot of focus, obviously, on refugee migration stuff as well. Okay. Especially we got to wrap up. Okay. Um, I would say, oh, let's talk. Yes, yeah. We have to wrap up. I mean, I just want to leave you with, um, we have been doing the work with the Laotian community for over a decade, but as we, we kind of did a quick slideshow of the other communities we're working with and where we're at is how does, how do the refugee, how can we connect the refugees communities together? Because there's, a, but of course each community, each story has its distinct differences, but it's a repetition of um, this, the refugee experiences, there's a repetition there and I think what we're trying to develop with our methodology is how do we then take the work we've done with the Lao community and work with other refugee communities to help tell their stories and help have that um, empowerment happen. Um, so like we've had recent refugees come and see the, the our story, our show Refugiation and be like, oh my God, that's happening in our community, is this what happens when you come to the United States? And we're like, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now there's resources. So some of the folks that um, we've met along the way who are OVA's generation, 1.5 generation, are now in key positions in like Catholic uh, social charities, refugee resettlement. Um, we've met immigration officers who were once refugees themselves. So I think that there has been progress. And so as artists, I'd like to be part of that progress of, of at least helping people, um, helping the new refugees. Um, adjust through art. Yeah. Well, uh, as we say in Lao, mahalo and thank you very much for uh, being as part of our session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.